welcome to this afternoon's webcast. The first of a series of four one-hour webcasts we'll be uh, holding uh, to discuss basic concepts on what is a value-added tax. This afternoon, uh, uh, one, a tax manager, Javier Oyola, is going to be joining me in explaining the first uh, topics and items that we'll be discussing in this series. My name is Maria de los Angeles Rivera, a partner, head of tax of the tax department here in Kiven Grand Thornton. As, as you uh, are, are aware and have seen in our invites, this series consists of four one-hour webcasts. Uh, today's topic is the general aspects. The next webcast, August 19, will be dedicated to accounting methods, adjustments, and debit and credit notes. The, ne the third one, on August 26, will be filings, documentations, and certificates. And the last one of this series is on September the 2nd, and we'll be uh, emphasizing the importance of an implementation process for this new tax in Puerto Rico. Today's agenda uh, consists of a basic introduction to a VAT, to what is a value-added tax system and some background information, what are taxable transactions, who is responsible for the payment of the tax, who is responsible for the collection of the tax, the credit, how the credit works for the VAT paid by businesses, will explain and discuss several examples, and hopefully by the end of the hour we'll have some time to attend some questions. Again, if we do not have enough time to cover the questions, we commit to answer them through via email. Just as a background information, and those of you that have joined us in our previous webcast have seen this diagram before, is the process and the progress of the tax reform that was approved during this year in Puerto Rico. Again, we are under Act 72 of 2015, which became law on May 29, 2015. And as of today, no amendments have been, uh, or no major amendments have been made to this, to this law. Uh, legislative process in Puerto Rico starts next week, so we are definitely expecting some movement in that area during the next couple of months. So, again, we'll keep you posted on any changes that are approved by the Puerto Rico legislature. The next diagram is a summary of, as of today, under Act 72, how both the sales and use tax and the VAT will be of application in Puerto Rico. Right now, we are in the second quadrant of this diagram from July 1st to September 30, we're still under a sales and use tax regime, but we had the increase from the 6% at the state level to the 10.5%. Still, designated services and B2B services continue to be exempt. The next phase of this reform starts in October 1st through March 31st. That's where the sales and use tax for business-to-business -business services and designated services will be 4% at the state level and no tax at the municipal level. And then, as is stated in Act 72, from April 1st on, we'll be under a VAT regime. Again, this is just for your reference and to, to, to put you in, in perspective. So what is, what is a value-added tax? And, and one of the principal questions that we find is whether a VAT is also or is the same as a GST. A value-added tax is a form of consumption tax. A GST, which is goods and services tax, is a broader concept. Value-added tax, usually it applies in the manufacturing context, where value is added to products through the manufacturing change, versus a goods and service tax, where in addition to the taxation of the value added to the, to, the mer to the merchandise or the manufacturing product, there is also taxation of services. So really in Puerto Rico, what has been approved is a GST, is a goods and services tax rather than a VAT. But again, these terms are used indistinctively around the world. So, so usually when somebody talks about a VAT or a GST, they're talking about the same thing. For the buyer, a VAT is a tax on the purchase price. That means the consumer, the one buying the taxable article or item or service, 
will pay the tax upon the purchase price, how much he's paying for that item or service. In the case of the seller, a VAT or a GST is a tax only on the value added to the product, the material or service by himself or herself. Why is this? Because the seller will be able, in most of the cases, to credit any VAT or GST that he or she has paid before to acquire the materials or the services to produce whatever it is that they're selling. And this is one of the major differences between a sales and use tax and a VAT. We'll be discussing this later on in the presentation. This table is just to present a sample of how VAT or GST is, is around the world. Uh, today, there are uh, more than 100 countries around the world that have either a VAT or a GST in place. And there we present some examples of rates through, you know, around the world, including the Americas, Europe, and Asia. Uh, we see that, you know, for example, Brazil has a 17%. The case of Brazil is, is really uh, different because in addition to the general VAT, they have so many other taxes that will definitely increase that 17% to something much, much higher. In the case of Canada, their GST is 5%. China has a 17%. And, for example, Russia, Russia has an 18% of VAT. So that's just to put you in some context on what's happening around the world in this area. Thanks for joining us today. As established in Act 72, the VAT will be in effect for transactions occurring after March 31, 2016, with a possible extension of 60 days if approved by the, uh, by the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, the general VAT rate will be 10.5% at the state level, as we have uh, as we have it right now under the current sales and use tax system, but that will be combined with the 1% municipal sales and use tax, resulting in a, in a total 11.5 rate on taxable articles and transactions. Uh, with this combination and based on what is currently written in the law, the merchants will have both systems in place, uh, the VAT at the state level and the sales and use tax at the municipal level. Besides the 10.5, rate, uh, there are several transactions which will, uh, will be subject to a 0% VAT rate, and among them we can find the sales of goods for export, we can find uh, export of services, and certain sales to manufacturing plants, specifically talking about raw materials equip and equipment for manufacturing process. It is important to mention that these manufacturing plants must, must have a valid exemption certificate issued by the Puerto Rico uh, Treasury Department. One important distinction between the, the VAT and the US, uh, the sales and use tax is that on the VAT, we have the regular or general rate, which is the 10.5%, and we also have a 0% rate. Please keep in mind that items that are taxed at a 0% rate are not items that are considered exempt or excludable. They are taxed items, but they are taxed at a 0% rate. We'll see the importance of this difference between 0% tax rate and exclusion or exemption further on when we discuss uh, the, the credit available for merchants. What is included in Act 72 as a taxable transaction for purposes of AT? There, there we have a sales uh, taxable item used storage or consumption of property or services in Puerto Rico, business-to-business -business services, and designated professional services such as agronomists, CPAs, engineers, architects, real estate brokers, professional draft persons, real estate appraisers, geologists, legal services, and tax return specialists. And also, the services rendered by a non-resident to a person in Puerto Rico will be considered a taxable transaction under the VAT. In every taxable transaction, somebody is responsible for the VAT. So in the introduction of a taxable item for use or consumption in Puerto Rico, the responsible is the person that introduced the article to Puerto Rico. In a non-retail sale, the seller acting as a withholding agent is primarily responsible, but the person that buys the goods or services is also responsible. Uh, in a retail sale, the seller acts as a, as a withholding agent, so is responsible of depositing the VAT at the Puerto Rico Treasury Department. 
And in the case of services rendered by a non-resident uh, to a Puerto Rico resident, the responsible is the person that receives the service in Puerto Rico. Here we, we need to make clear what is meant by retail sales. Retail sales are not the sales that we usually consider a retail sales, you know, the ones that you go to a, uh, a store and buy uh, at retail. For purposes of that, a retail sale is a sale made to someone who is not a merchant. So we can have a merchant purchasing at retail, but that would, uh, that would be considered a non-retail sale. This is a very important distinction to be made and, and like a change in, in mindset when we talk about retail sales. So we will probably have retail sales as we see them usually every day, but under the VAT concept, it's only when it's made to a non-merchant. Why is this? Again, because merchants will be able to use any VAT that they pay in their acquisition as a credit further on uh, when they're preparing their tax returns and, and making payments to the Puerto Rico Treasury Department. So very important, retail sales are only those sales made to non-merchants. Okay, uh, in general terms, every merchant that sells a good or service subject to the 10.5 must collect the VAT, except for those merchants holding a small merchant's registration certificate who will not be charging the VAT but will not be allowed to take credits. The small merchant's registration certificate is not automatically issued by the Puerto Rico Treasury it will need to be requested, and as a requirement to the request, the gross sales of the prior year must be less than $125,000. Here, under the VAT, different also from the sales and use tax, there are only two situations where a seller will be allowed not to collect, or, or, or we can say the responsibility to collect the VAT will be waived in any sale where the purchaser presents a certificate of extent purchases, or a certificate of manufacturing plant. Only those two buyers will be allowed to acquire merchandise or, or equipment or any taxable item, including services, without the imposition of the VAT. There are no other exemptions to this rule. So please bear in mind only two situations where the seller is his responsibility is waived from, from the withholding of the tax. When the buyer presents a certificate of exempt purchases and when the buyer presents a certificate of manufacturing plant. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, the major difference between the sales and use tax and the VAT or the value-added tax is the opportunity that the merchants have to credit any VAT they have paid upon any of their acquisitions or what we call inputs, services, equipment, merchandise, inventory, uh, that they have paid in order to be able to produce or render the service they, they perform will be able to credit those, that tax against their responsibility or the tax that they would need to deposit with the Department of Treasury. So this is really important for merchants to, to understand and to understand the importance to be able to collect all the information and or documentation that you will need in order to substantiate these credits that you're going to be paying. Okay. Again, as, as Javier mentioned, every merchant except the small merchant, the ones that hold the small merchant's registra registration certificate, will be allowed to claim a credit for the VAT pay during the corresponding month. And how is this, this credit computed? Well, the amount of the credit to be claimed uh, in any given month will be calculated uh, by adding the following items. First, the VAT paid on the introduction of articles, 
that is directly or indirectly related to the sale of taxable goods or services subject either to the 0% rate or the 10.5% rate. Okay? If, if uh, like for example, you are in the business of wholesaler or distribution and you are the one introducing the, the goods for resale, then you will be able to claim the credit uh, for the tax that you have paid in these uh, articles as long as when you sell these articles, they're either subject to a 0% rate or 10.5% rate. If what you sell is exempt, then you will not be able to credit any VAT that you have paid, and we'll go over that uh, later in our webcast today. <clears throat> in addition to this amount, you have to add the VAT paid on any purchase of goods and services that is directly or indirectly related to the sale of taxable goods or services. And the last part of this computation is any VAT paid by the merchant for services rendered by a non-resident person. That is, you are here in Puerto Rico doing business and you contract someone in the States, for example, to provide some professional services from the mainland, you, as, as we mentioned before, you as the resident merchant in Puerto Rico are responsible to pay the tax upon those services. It's like a self-imposition of the tax. It's what we call a use tax on, on services. And you'll be required to include those services in your monthly uh, VAT return. Only if you have included those services and paid the tax, you'll be able to claim a credit for those taxes. The law provides uh, certain exemptions to the requirement of, of, of items uh, subject to tax or, or CO tax rate to be able to, be, uh, to credit the VAT that you pay. And those cases are, are those merchants that are engaged substantially engaged in the sale of food items, including cash and carries. Uh, those merchants substantially engage in the sale of medical uh, medicine, for example, or medical products. And also those merchants engage in the sale of motor vehicles. Those three, even though the sales they produce are exempt or excluded from the imposition of a VAT, they'll be able to credit any VAT that they paid during their operations. In those cases in which it cannot be determined if the VAT paid corresponds directly to a particular good, it will be considered that it's related to the sale of an exempt good and therefore will not be creditable. However, the law states that in the case that you have input, like, you know, you pay for services, merchandise, equipment, and you cannot directly relate that, that input, that purchase you made to your sale of, 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 or the service you provide, then you'll be able to allocate the VAT paid upon those purchases between the taxable and the exempt sales. Well, Further on in our webcast today, we'll see an example of how this is done and how does it work. In addition to the credit for the VAT paid, uh, the code also provides a credit for those merchants that pay VAT to foreign countries upon services rendered by related parties outside of Puerto Rico. What this means is, like for example, you're here in Puerto Rico, have a contract with an affiliated company outside of Puerto Rico, let's say in Argentina, to provide you some services from Argentina, um, and based on the Argentinian VAT law, that, that service is subject to a VAT there, here in Puerto Rico, you'll be able to credit against the tax that you have to auto-impose to you for the services rendered outside Puerto Rico. You'll be able to credit the VAT you pay to the Argentinian government. So that's an additional credit available under the VAT. Uh, well, how does it work? 
in this example, we have three persons involved, but we are not including any numbers to make it e to make it easier. But first, we have the importer who is who pays the VAT in the introduction of the merchandise based on the cost of the articles. Uh, then he sells uh, the merchandise to the retailer and collects the VAT based on the sales price and takes the credit for the VAT paid in the introduction against the VAT collected from the from the retailer. Uh, at second, we have the retailer who pays the VAT to the importer when acquires the merchandise and collects the VAT from his customer based on his sales price and takes the credit for the VAT paid to the importer against the VAT collected from his customer. And finally, we have a, a consumer who pays the VAT on the purchase of goods from the retailer, but is not allowed to take any credit. As, as these very simple examples uh, provide you, you can see that the tax is going to be paid to the Puerto Rico Treasury Department throughout the different stages in the chain, but really who is bearing the whole responsibility or the whole burden of the tax is the consumer, the last part on the chain, which is the one that pays the full amount of the VAT on its purchase, but it not allow any credits. Remember back when the proposal, the very first bill was proposed, 2329, back in February, there was a proposition there to provide for some relief to certain type of consumers for, for this VAT, but this was not part and was not included in Act 72. So as of today, final consumers are not allowed any credits. But again, as we mentioned at the beginning, through the change, the merchants will be able to recover the VAT they had paid on their acquisitions or on their purchases from the VAT they collect uh, from the from from their consumer. Okay. Now we are going to go through three different examples in three different industries of how this VAT system will work under Act 72 in order to, to be able to understand this, base, this basic concept that we have talked about. Uh, I wanted to stress the, the fact that we are entering in, in the discussion of a very basic items and, and, and concepts of the system because we have uh, noticed during the last couple of months uh, that, for example, under the sales and use tax, which has been in Puerto Rico since 2006, the changes that were made by Act 72 were not that substantial, mostly a change in tax rate and the change on the treatment of the services. But we have realized that there are a lot of doubts and questions as to the basic concept of how the tax works. So that's why we're, we're, we are going into very basic terms and how it works on a very basic manner. So we're sure we understand how it works and when you're going to be applying this to your specific situation, you'll be able to apply the terms to your specific situation. So right now, we're going to be giving and discussing three different examples. The first one is uh, for wholesale and retail industries. How this, this tax system will impact this entity, or an entity engaged in, in this type of business. We have three steps, and I will, will ask you to follow the numbers, one, two, and three, because that's like the flow or the normal flow of the transaction in this, in this industry. First of all, if you're engaged in the retail or wholesale, you import or you purchase items. In the case of, of this example, uh, our, our business uh, imported and purchased clothes for $3 million and some office equipment for $500,000. Both the clothes and the office equipment are subject to the 10.5% tax, so he pays upon introduction of these items into Puerto Rico $367,500. Please note that in the center of our example, we have like a basket, a basket where this merchant is collecting all the VAT it's, it's paying through the flow of, of its operation. That that basket we need to transport 
or 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 make that same type of basket within your accounting systems and IT systems in order for you to be able to collect all the necessary information you need to be able to determine how much credit you have available. So in step one, this merchant paid $367,500. In step two, in addition to importing or introducing merchandise, this merchant also bought and acquire locally in Puerto Rico clothes and other taxable items for $5.5 million. <clears throat> Upon those purchases, this merchant paid $577,500 to whomever he, he bought these this, uh, items from. And again, we put that in our basket of total tax paid of $577,500. In addition, the merchant also bought services in Puerto Rico for an amount of 1.1 million, and it paid $115,500 for those services in tax. So up to now, our merchant in step one or two paid a total of $1,060,500 in VAT. Our merchant is engaged in selling, retailer or wholesaler of these products that he had bought and during this month, he, he sold $12,200,000 uh, to its customers. And all its sales were taxable, so he collected VAT from its customers of $1,281,000. When these merchants sit to prepare its monthly VAT return to determine how much tax it must remit to the Puerto Rico Treasury Department, he has to compare how much he had collected from its customers, that's the $1.281 million, against the available credits he has. Remember, he imported products, he bought products and services locally. So he had paid $1,060,500 in VAT to its suppliers. So when he determines how much he has to deposit with the Department of Treasury, he will only deposit the $220,500, which is the difference between the two amounts. He keeps the $1.6 million because it's like a recovery of the VAT he has paid prior to its suppliers and deposits the difference. In this case, 100% of the sales are taxable sales, so that's why we are able to credit 100% of the credits we have. In, 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 in future webcasts, we'll be talking about what happens if what they collect in, in the, during the month is less than the credits they have available, whether you, the merchant has the right to claim a refund or a, or a credit to be credit for, uh, carried forward. For future months, we'll talk about that in a further future webcast. And lastly, the third part on our trans cycle or on our transaction cycle is the customer, the one that acquires the merchandise. If the customer who is acquiring the merchandise is a final consumer, that's it. That's the final of the cycle. The final consumer acquires the goods and cannot credit any any tax. If the one acquiring, like for example in the case of a wholesaler, is another merchant, then the whole cycle starts again. And and this is in, in very simple terms how uh, the VAT cycle will operate in a retail wholesale environment. Uh, now we're going to discuss an example of the service industry. Um, In the first place, at the bottom left corner, we have a service provider who imports office equipment and supplies for $250,000 and pays uh, the value-added tax of $26,000 on, on the office equipment. As Maria mentioned in the prior uh, example, we are going to have our bucket of PAT paid in the middle of the slide. So you will see those $26,000 of the imported products. Uh, on the second place, uh, the service provider 
buys locally equipment and supplies for $750,000 and pays the VAT of $78,000 to the seller. In the middle of the slide, you will also find the $78,000 below the $26,000 of the first transaction. The service provider also buys professional services in the, in the amount of $300,000 and pays the value-added tax of $31,000 that is also shown in the middle of the slide. So the total amount paid by the service provider is $136,000 of VAT. The service provider uh, exports uh, some professional services in the amount of $1.5 million, and those uh, services are subject to the 0% VAT rate, which uh, we explained before, uh, are not exempt. It's 0% VAT rate because they are they're being exported. And also, he sells professional services locally to individuals and business in the amount of 5 5 million. He will not be able to collect the VAT on the 1.5 million, but uh, will be collecting the tax on the services provided locally. And that is why he uh, collected $577,000 of VAT, which are related to the $5.5 million of services that he provided locally. Uh, the service provider is allowed to take a credit for the VAT paid uh, the $136,000 uh, against the VAT collected, which are the uh, $577,000. Uh, and he will reduce the, the $136,000 from the, from the 577 and will deposit the difference uh, at the Puerto Rico Treasury Department, which is uh, $400,041. The final consumer pays the value of the tax and is not allowed to take any credit unless it is a registered merchant, as Maria mentioned it before. That was the example for the service. And here, please bear, see that we included both sales subject to the 0% tax rate and to the 10.5% tax rate, and sees since both are taxable items, the, the only difference is the tax rate upon which they are taxed, the seller or the service provider is able to credit 100% of the tax they paid because it's, it, it, there's the sales or the services they perform are either taxed at 0% or 10.5. They're not exempt. Okay? The third example we are going to be uh, discussing is the manufacturing industry. In the case of a manufacturing plan, how, how the, the VAT cycle will, will work. And basically, again, we have the three steps here and our basket in the center. The first step is the manufacturing plan, importing or purchasing raw materials, which are subject to a 0% VAT of 1.5 million and other taxable goods of 1.5 million. Remember, we discussed before that manufacturing plants will be allowed to introduce or acquire manufacturing uh, or items or articles to be used in the manufacturing process at 0% rate only if they hold a certificate of manufacturing plant. Uh, the certificate, again, is not automatic, has to be requested, and in a, a future webcast, I think it's on the third webcast, we'll be talking about certificates. So we're, in our example, our manufacturing plant is a holder of, of one of these certificates. So it's allowed to acquire, and the sellers are, are allowed to sell to this merchant at a 0% tax rate. So this merchant, again, introduced raw materials of 1.5 and taxable goods of 1.5. Again, upon the introduction, only the 1.5 of other taxable goods are are subject to the 10.5% or 157,500. That goes into our basket in the center. In addition, the manufacturing plant acquires locally raw material for the manufacturing. Again, this raw material uh, tax as a 0% rate. Acquires computer equipment and other products which are not used in the manufacturing process for 3 million and therefore upon those purchases, 
the manufacturing plant pays $315,000 of VAT. Again, that goes into our basket. And lastly, the manufacturing plant also buys uh, professional services and other supplies in the amount of $1.2 million, subject to the 10.5% rate because, again, there's, these are not items used in the manufacturing process, and pays a VAT of $126,000. Again, we have a total VAT paid for that month of $598,500. What can we do with this credit, with this VAT paid? Okay, let's see what they sell. This manufacturing plant, manufactures, of course, a product, uh, sells the product, and some of the product is used for export, and some of the product is sold locally. Uh, it sells uh, locally $14,500,000, and again, this product is not exempt. It's subject to a 10.5%, so the manufacturing plant collects one point five almost one point five million dollars of VAT. There is no tax collected on the sales for export because they are subject to a zero percent tax rate. Remember, export services and export of merchandise are subject to zero percent rate. Since the total amount of the sales made by this manufacturing plant is either subject to a zero percent or to the ten point five percent it, can, it does not have to um, allocate the VAT they have paid because all the sales are taxable sales. So the business, the manufacturing plant, will credit the $598,500 they paid against the tax they collected from its customers, which is the 1.5. So by the time they're filing their, their return, their monthly return, they will only have to deposit $924,000 at the Puerto Rico Treasury Department and recover the whole amount of the VAT they have paid during that month. The customer that bought from the manufacturing plant will most likely be uh, another business, a local distributor, for example, and that local distributor will be able to credit uh, the taxes they have paid, they have paid on on the their purchases or, or their their articles, depending on on what they sell or what they produce and and the allocation, if any, that would be needed. Maybe they are selling fully taxable uh, items, so they will be able to fully tax uh, credit or recover the credit, and that will take us back to example number one for a retailer or wholesaler. Uh, if the product is bought to render a service and the service then end up in being an exempt services, then the merchant, for example, will not be able to credit any tax uh, against the collected tax from its customer. Uh, as a final example, we have uh, one related to the allocation of the credit which is a little bit different from the ones that we presented before, but uh, we're gonna uh, explain it uh, very easy. In this case, we have a supermarket which uh, sells taxable and non-taxable property. The supermarket pays the VAT on some direct costs, like supplies for $6,000, uh, but will not be paying on others like the unprepared food. The supermarket also has some indirect cost, subject to the VAT for a total amount of $9,000, which are uh, divided between shopping carts, uh, some utilities like the, tel like the telephones, and other services. Uh, so the total amount paid uh, of VAT paid by the supermarket is $15,000. Uh, then on the other side, the supermarket sells uh, $500,000 of merchandise composed of unprepared food for $375,000 that corresponds to 75% of the total sales and supplies in the amount of $125,000 corresponding to the 25% of the total sales. Uh, they are required to collect the VAT on the supplies because the unprepared food is not subject to VAT. Therefore, they, they are collecting uh, $13,000 $13, of VAT for the supplies only. So 
So here is here is how the allocation works. The merchant is allowed to take a full credit for the VAT paid on the direct cost, which are the six thousand dollars of VAT paid on on the supplies. But we'll have to verify w which was the pro the proportion of taxable uh, uh, sales in order to apply it to the indirect cost. Therefore, since the taxable sales were only 25% of the total sales, that 25% is applied to the remaining $9,000 of VAT paid on indirect costs to get the maximum credit to be taken. When you multiply the VAT of $9,000 by 25%, uh, the merchant is allowed to take a credit, an additional credit for the, in, the VAT paid on the indirect cost of $2,250 related to those indirect costs. Therefore, uh, they will be depositing the $4,875 to the Puerto Rico Treasury Department, which is the difference between the VAT collected on the sales and the credit that they are allowed to be taken. Please notice the difference between this example and the examples that we had discussed before. In the case, for example, of the manufacturing plant and the service provider that had sales subject to the 0% rate, they were able to claim the full amount of the tax as a credit because they didn't have exempt or excluded sales. In this case that Javier discussed, there's the supermarket case where they are selling food and food is excluded uh, from taxation, we, it's not the same as when it's zero rated. Okay? When, when it's exempt, the business, the supermarket in this case, is not able to credit that portion of those indirect costs, the VAT paid on those indirect costs, because part of the sales were exempt. And this part is, is, is the, the, the food part. And that's why you, the, the rules established and very clearly established in the law is how this allocation is going to be made. The allocation is going to be made on a uh, taxable versus non-taxable uh, percentage allocation. Uh, uh, and as Javier explained on the example, in this case, the taxable sales were only 25% of the total sales. So this business can only credit 25% of those indirect costs, uh, the tax paid on those indirect costs against the tax collected uh, for the sale of the taxable items. And that's the very basic difference between what is an exempt or excluded item and uh, what is a theoretic item. That's why when we enter into discussions and, 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 and people are, are eager to have what or have the services they provide or the, or the sales they do classified as exempt or excludable for VAT, that really is not a, such a good solution for the business unless you are one of the three businesses we talked about before that even though they are selling uh, exempt uh, items, can credit a uh, portion of, of their sales. So, so it's very important when you're working on your uh, uh, planification of the implementation of this VAT system in your business, the importance of a careful mapping and careful identification of everything you sell and everything you buy in order to maximize the amount of credits you're going to be able to take, it's very important. And on the last of our webcast this, in this series, we'll talk more in depth about what is this implementation process, what it undertakes, and why it's so important for you as a business to be uh, aware of this and prepare for this implementation. We have some questions and we have time to attend some of the questions that we have. The, the first question we have is uh, if a retailer imports goods to be used for either a government contractor or a contract for manufacturer, does the retailer need to pay the VAT upon import? Uh, it, it, it's a very interesting question. We will uh, address it. It's two parts. If you are a retailer that sells to a manufacturer, and this point we have covered before, if your manufacturing client provides you uh, the, the zero rated or, or, or the, the exempt certificate, you don't have to collect, but you can claim the credit 
for the tax you paid, even though your sales are exempt. If what you uh, sell is, uh, for example, raw materials, those will be exempt, and you will not have to pay the, the, the tax upon import. So you will have, uh, we will need to, to determine what is it that you are importing and, and to whom you are selling, and if your client has the necessary certificates for that. In the case of the government contractor, remember we talked about um, the case of those that are, are the, the seller is, his responsibility to collect the tax is waived. One of those situations is when uh, the seller provides a certificate of exempt sales. Uh, the government is one of the four different types of merchants that can uh, obtain or can have one of these um, certificates of exempt purchases. What those that allows you as, a, as, as the seller to, to the government, for example, is to be able to... Uh, to uh, claim a credit on your on your uh, tax return, and if you have uh, a credit available, you will be able to obtain a refund from the Puerto Rico Treasury Department as an eligible merchant. But again, this is not automatic. An eligible merchant has to request and uh, and meet certain requirements to be able to be classified as an eligible merchant in order to be able to credit and obtain a refund from the Puerto Rico Treasury Department. Um, the next question we have here uh, is, uh, is if whether rent will pay VAT depends on what type of rent. Again, we didn't enter into that discussion here, but um, if it's commercial rent, that will be exempt, including parking spaces. Uh, this was a, a long discussion when the Bill 2329 was under uh, scrutiny in the legislature. At the beginning, it was not exempt, but finally at the end, it turned out to be exempt. And also the rent of uh, a, a, a real property which constitutes principal residence of the person living it, and, it's, and if it's dedicated to uh, uh, people or, or uh, residents of... Uh, uh, senior citizens, for example. If it's dedicated to senior citizens' uh, residential property, that will also be exempt. But basically, the commercial rent, yes, remains exempt from VAT. How much time we keep evidence for credits taken? <laughs> Forever. Uh, <laughs> usually the law says that you need to keep all the documentation for six years. But again, knowing our current situation in Puerto Rico, we always recommend to keep them probably for more than the six years, 10 years at least, at least 10 years. When, when we talk about the documentation for the credit, and, and this will be discussed uh, in, one, in another webcast, but remember that we talk about the three components of the credit. The first component was the introduction of, uh, of goods by the, you know, by, by the merchant in Puerto Rico. That tax, if the item you're introducing is taxable, it's paid upon introduction through the PICO system. You know, you have to do your declaration, and if you're bonded, and then you, you have uh, until the 10th date of the following month to do the payment. But that will be your evidence of the payment. Then you have the local purchases you do. And for those local purchases, you will need to obtain what is called a fiscal <clears throat> invoice, or what we call in Spanish the comprobante fiscal. The Puerto Rico Treasury Department has not issued guidance yet as to how this fiscal statement is going to be provided, it says by any means, and we are, we are most certainly sure that the electronic means will be the preferred means here because you can imagine how many fiscal statements you will need to collect every month in order to be able to credit. So a certain form, electronic form, will be signed and developed, and, and that will be your proof of payment of the tax pay on local purchases in, in, an, in, I think it's in the second webcast, we'll talk about the fiscal statement and what it has to be included. But basically, in general terms, a merchant, a buyer merchant, has to ask for or, or, or has a grace period of 30 days to ask for this fiscal statement from its supplier, and then the supplier has 30 days to provide the fiscal statement from the day it was requested. So we're talking about probably a maximum of 60 days from one thing to another, and, and again, internal processes will need to be developed in order to 
to, to maximize and, and minimize, maximize efficiency and minimize administrative burden in providing and or getting these fiscal statements. And then the third component of the credit is any tax you pay yourself auto-imposed on services that you have contracted outside Puerto Rico. Those are auto-imposed, so you will have to include that the amount of the services in your monthly return, and that will be your evidence that you have paid your tax on that. So again, there is a lot of documentation that has to be collected through the process and kept in order to be able to provide and substantiate your credit. We have a follow-up question on, on the importation of, of items sold to manufacturing plants and, and its manufacturing equipment. Again, technically, if you're introducing manufacturing equipment and you'll be importing it for to be sold to a manufacturing plant with a certificate, that would be taxed at a zero rate, and therefore no tax has to be paid on that importation. But again, it's very important that your client uh, has the, the, the manufacturing plant uh, certificate. We don't have any other questions online. Again, thank you for, for your attendance today. We want to remind all of you that we still have three more webcasts on this series. The next one is next Wednesday. And there we'll be talking about uh, accounting methods that need to be followed, adjustments, and debit and credit notes. In addition, we also have to remind you that on September 23rd of this year, we'll be holding our annual tax conference. Further information will be circulated to all of you in the next couple of weeks. So again, thank you very much for attending today and have a nice afternoon.